Theistic Evolution Critique, Theistic Evolution and Christians. We've been looking at the book, uh, Theistic Evolution, Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. You'll notice that the first named author is J.P. Moreland, and this will be his chapter. As we get into it, I will remind you, as I've done before, that uh, there are several ways of approaching the um, the creation evolution uh, controversy. Uh, one of them is to go with a uh, young life creationism. There are several variations on that. Uh, one of them is to go with what's traditionally called an old earth creationism, but also really means an old life creation. Uh, one of them is to go with a theistic evolution that is intelligent design friendly, that is to say, Yes, things evolved. Yes, they went slowly. But you can tell that it didn't happen all by itself. You can tell that God's hand is in this more or less directly. Uh, then there is non-intelligent design-friendly theistic evolution. That is to say, if you look at the appearances, it looks like standard atheistic evolution. But we know God was behind it. But we know that by faith, not by any evidence that we have. And then, of, our, of course, there is a complete disregard of uh, uh, creation at all. That, that God's hand wasn't even in it in any way because there was no God. And that, of course, is atheistic evolution. This book does not aim primarily to uh, speak to that issue. This uh, book is primarily aimed at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. And this is one of the key chapters uh, because of that. This is the first chapter in the book that, that actually deals primarily with the implications of theistic evolution if you accept it. It's written by J.P. Moreland, as I mentioned. It's in the philosophical section, the section two of the book. And its title, excuse me, is how theistic evolution kicks Christianity out of the plausibility structure and robs Christians of confidence that the Bible is a source of knowledge. And that title pretty much sums up uh, what his conclusion is going to be. The summary that is given starts out, we can have knowledge that is justified true belief of a wide range of things, logic, mathematics, the truth of Christianity, various biblical doctrines, ethical truths, and so forth. While important, science is only one of the many ways humans know things. However, given the widespread scientism, the view that the hard scientists are the sciences are the only or the vastly superior way to know things, hard scientism or soft scientism, what you might call, especially in comparison to theology and ethics, in our culture, theistic evolution has reinforced this view by constantly revising biblical teachings and interpretations because science says so. I think that's a very deep critique. Thus, by adopting this unbiblical epistemological outlook, theistic evolution has weakened the rational authority of biblical teaching among Christians and non-Christians. As a result, the Bible is no longer regarded by many as a genuine source of knowledge, and fewer and fewer people take the Bible seriously. In this way, perhaps unintentionally, and I'm sure unintentionally for some, the, those who adopt theistic evolution marginalize Christian truth claims in the church and the public square. And that's the summary. In 1941, Harvard sociologist Batirim A. Sorokin Sarkin wrote a book titled The Crisis of Our Age. Sarkin divided cultures into three major types, two of which are relevant to this chapter, sensate and integral. A sensate culture is one in which people believe only in the reality of the physical universe capable of being experienced with the five senses. A sensate culture is secular, this worldly, and empirical. Knowledge is limited to the sense-perceptible world. By contrast, an integral culture embraces a sensory world but goes on to accept the notion 
that an extra empirical immaterial reality can be known as well, a reality consisting of God, the soul, immaterial beings, values, purposes, and various abstract objects such as numbers and propositions. <clears throat> uh, Sorokin noted that a sensate culture eventually disintegrates because it lacks the intellectual resources necessary to sustain a public and private life conducive to corporate and individual human flourishing. After all, if we can't know anything about values, life after death, God, and so forth, how can we receive solid guidance to lead a life of wisdom and character? As we move through the early portions of the 21st century, it is obvious that the culture of the West, including the United States, is sensate rather than integral. To see this, consider the following. In 1989, the state of California issued a new science framework to provide guidance for the state's public so school science classrooms. In that document, advice is given to teachers about how to handle students who approach them with reservations about the theory of evolution. At times, some students may insist that certain conclusions of science cannot be true because of certain religious or philosophical beliefs they hold. It is appropriate for the teacher to express, by the way, those are black, those are his ellipses, not mine. It is appropriate for the teacher to express in this regard, I understand that you may have personal reservations about accepting this scientific evidence, but it is scientific knowledge about which there is no reasonable doubt among scientists in their field, and it is my responsibility to teach it because it is part of our common intellectual heritage. The real importance of this statement lies not in its promotion of evolution over creation, though that is no small matter in its own right. No, the real danger in the framework's advice resides in the picture of knowledge it presupposes. The only knowledge we can have about reality, and thus the only claims that deserve the backing of public institutions, is empirical knowledge gained by the hard sciences. Not empirical claims, those that cannot be tested with the five senses, outside of the hard sciences, such as those at the core of ethics, political theory, and religion, are not items of knowledge, but rather matters, matters of private feeling. Note carefully the words associated with science, conclusions, evidence, knowledge, no reasonable doubt, intellectual heritage. These deeply cognitive terms express the view that science and science alone exercises the intellectual right and responsibility of defining reality. By contrast, religious claims are described in distinctively non-cognitive language, beliefs, personal reservations. In such a culture, we now live and move and have our being. Apologies to Paul in Acts 19. Currently, a three-way worldview struggle rages in our culture between ethical monotheism, especially Christianity, Postmodernism, roughly a cultural form of relativism about truth, reality, and value, and scientific naturalism. I cannot undertake here a detailed characterization of scientific naturalism, but I want to say a word about its role in shaping the crisis of the West. Scientific naturalism takes the view that the physical cosmos studied by science is all there is. Scientific naturalism has two central components, a view of reality and a view of how we know things. Regarding reality, scientific naturalism implies that everything that exists is composed of matter or emerges out of matter when it achieves a suitable complexity. There is no spiritual world, no God, no angels or demons, no life after death, no moral absolutes, no objective purpose of life, and no such thing as the kingdom of God. And scientific naturalism, that is strong scientism, suggests that physical science is the only, or if you go with weak scientism, at the very least, a vastly superior way of gaining knowledge. Spiritual competence is a silly idea, since spiritual knowledge, as science has repeatedly shown, does not exist. And the same claim would be made and is being made regarding ethical assertions and moral behavior. Since there is no known spiritual knowledge or competence, Oprah Winfrey feels free to pontificate about matters religious. After all, she is indeed an authority about her own private feelings and subjective beliefs. But she would never do this if the topic were a scientific one. Why? Because there are experts she would call into, uh, she would call into her show. What is an expert? Is someone with the relevant knowledge. Since there are no experts in ethics or religion, Oprah is free to say what she wants in those areas of discourse without fear of censure. 
In the early 1960s, naturalist Wilfred Sellers announced that in the dimensions of describing and explaining the world, science is the measure of all things, of what is that it is and what is not that it is not. As we shall see in more detail later, combined with postmodernism, scientism raises the central challenge to the Christian church at this time in history. The central issue is not whether Christianity is true. One could claim Christianity is true and is based on blind faith and emotion and that would probably be tolerated by European and Northern, uh, North American elites. The central issue is whether Christianity can be known to be true. Years ago, I was invited to speak at an evangelistic dessert. It's an interesting phrase there. And I was put on notice by one believer that he was bringing his boss, a man who had been a chief engineer for decades, who was, finished, who finished, was finishing a belated PhD in physics from John Hopkins, and who went out of his way to attack and ridicule Christians. Upon being introduced to me at the dessert table, he wasted no time in launching into me. I understand you are a philosopher and a theologian, he said in an amused manner. Before I had a chance to respond, he said, I used to be interested in those things when I was a teenager, but I have outgrown those interests. I know now that the only sort of knowledge of reality is that which can be and has been quantified and tested in the laboratory. If you can measure it and test it scientifically, you can know it. If not, the topic is nothing but private opinion and idle speculation. Boom. This is what I mean by scientism. It never occurred to the gentleman that his claim was self-refuting since the claim could not itself be quantified and tested in the laboratory. Scientism accords the right to define reality and speak with knowledge and authority to scientists and scientists alone. And this posture is, sadly, pervasive throughout our culture. In the June 25, 2001 issue of Time magazine, the cover story was entitled, How the Universe Will End? How yeah, how the universe will end, question mark. It should be, how will the universe end, but whatever. The universe is winding down, the story said, and it will eventually go out with a cold, dark whimper. The main issue of concern is the article's implicit epistemology theory of knowledge. It claims that for centuries, humans have wanted to know how all this will end, but because they could only use religion and philosophy, solid answers were unavailable. But now that science has moved into this area of inquiry for the first time in human history, we have firm answers to our questions, answers that will force religion and philosophy to rethink their views. This same attitude is currently pervasive about the origin and nature of human beings and the ethical values, views especially those about sexual ethics, we've inherited from Christianity. This is scientism, and Time magazine employed the naturalist epistemology without batting an eye or indeed without knowing it was doing so. In the same issue, Time featured an article defending stem cell research on human embryos. These embryos are microscopic groupings of a few differentiated cells. There is nothing human about them except potential, and if you choose to believe it, a soul. Note the presupposed scientism. We know scientific facts about embryos, but non-scientific issues like the reality of the soul are not items of knowledge. When it comes to belief in the soul, you're on your own. There is no evidence one way or another. In a scientific culture, belief in the soul is like belief in ghosts, an issue best left to the pages of the National Enquirer. No wonder people in our churches increasingly fail to take Christianity seriously. It is on the basis of knowledge or perceived knowledge, not faith, mere truth, commitment, or sincerity that people are given the right to lead, act in public, and accomplish important tasks. We give certain people the right to fix our cars, pull our teeth, write our contracts, counsel our souls, and so on, because we take those people to be in possession of the relevant body of knowledge. Moreover, it is the possession of knowledge, and more specifically, the knowledge that one has knowledge, and not mere truth alone that gives people confidence and courage to lead, act, and risk. Accordingly, it is of crucial importance that we promote the central teachings of Christianity in general as a body of knowledge and not as a set of faith practices to be accepted on the basis of mere belief or a shared narrative alone. To fail at this point is to risk being marginalized and disregarded as those promoting a privatized set of feelings or desires that fall short of knowledge. 
In 1983, Os Guinness wrote a book in which he claimed that the church had become its own gravedigger. The upshot of Guinness's claim was that the very things that were bringing short-term growth in the Christian community were also, unintentionally and un imperceptibly, sowing the very sorts of ideas that would eventually undercut the church's distinctive power and authority. The so-called gravedigger does not hurt the church on purpose. Usually well-intentioned, he or she simply adopts views or practices that are counterproductive to and undermining of a vibrant, attractive Christian community. In my view, there are certain contemporary currents of thought that risk undercutting Christianity as a source of knowledge, and I shall argue that by its very nature, theistic evolution is the prime culprit. It is one of the church's leading grave diggers. This is probably the core of what he's going to be saying. Um, for instance, we may think that not encouraging potential converts to reject theistic evolution will cause more to come to Christ. But in the long run, the price to be paid by such an approach is the decognitivizing of Christianity, making Christianity a religion that has nothing at all to do with the mind or reason, with the result that over the long haul, most people will simply ignore Christianity as a silly superstition whose practices, practitioners caved into the prevailing contemporary currents of ideas instead of holding their ground and eventually winning the argument due to hard-hitting scholarship and confidence in the Bible. In what follows, I shall first clarify the nature of knowledge, and second, identify the nature of plausibility structure along with the central plausibility structure constituting our contemporary milieu, and third, identify three intellectual areas that, if embraced, run the risk of turning us into our own grave diggers. As I hope to show, these three areas are natural results of embracing theistic evolution. The nature of knowledge. Here's a simple definition of knowledge. It is to represent reality and thought or experience the way it really is on the basis of adequate grounds. Knowledge is true belief based on adequate grounds. To know something, for example, the nature of cancer, forgiveness, or God, is to think of our, our experience re as it really is on a solid basis of evidence, experience, intuition, and so forth. Please note that knowledge has nothing to do with epistemological certainty, the logical impossibility of being wrong, or an anxious quest for it. One can know something without being epistemologically certain about it. Psychological certainty is different. It is a sense of complete confidence and rest than an idea. And no, one can know in the presence of doubt or the admission that one might be wrong. When Paul says, this you know with certainty, he certainly, he clearly implies that one can know without certainty. Otherwise, the statement would be redundant. The deepest issue facing the church today is this. Are its main creeds and central teachings items of knowledge or mere matters of blind faith? privatized personal beliefs, issues of feelings to be accepted or set aside according to the individual or cultural pressures that come and go. Do these teachings have cognitive and behavioral authority that set a worldview framework for authority? I'm sorry, I obviously copied extra there. Uh, let's see, that set a worldview framework for approaching science, art, ethics, indeed all of life. Or are cognitive and behavioral authority set by what scientists, evolutionary biologists, or the members of Biologus say, or by what Gallup polls tell us is embraced by cultural and intellectual elites? Do we turn to these sources and then set aside or revise 2,000 years of Christian thinking and doctrinal creedal expressions in order to make Christian teachings acceptable to the neuroscience department at UCLA or the paleontologists at Cambridge? In my view, as theistic evolutionists continue to revise the Bible over and over again, they inexorably give the off a message about knowledge. Science gives us hard knowledge based on evidence with which we can be confident, and while theology and biblical teachings do not give us knowledge, they pro provide personal meaning and values for those with the faith to embrace them. The importance of a plausibility structure. Take a look at figure 21.1, .1, which we'll see very shortly. And notice what you see. Notice that the vertical line on the right looks longer than the one on the left, even though their lengths are the same. Why? Because we see these shapes hundreds of times a day. The right diagram is the inside corner of a room. 
The left is the outside corner of a building, and we are unconsciously used to seeing them as three-dimensional objects, and so we unconsciously try to adjust to the two-dimensionality of the figures on the page. There they are. Some of you have seen this before. So, generally speaking, we experience that as uh, this one appears to be longer than that one. In this case, our habits of perception and thoughts shape. No, they don't completely determine, they just shape what we see. When this diagram is shown to people in primitive cultures with no square or rectangular buildings, they have no such subconscious habits and they see the horizontal lengths accurately as being of equal length. There's an important lesson in this. A culture has a set of background assumptions, we can call it a plausibility structure, that sets a tone, a framework, for what people think, what they are willing to listen to and evaluate, how they feel and how they act. This plausibility structure is so widespread and subtle that people usually don't even know it's there, even though it hugely impacts their perspective on the world. The plausibility structure can be composed of thoughts, scientists are smart, religious people are gullible and dumb, symbols, a person in a white lab coat, music, and so forth. For example, a book published by Oxford University Press will be taken by a reader to be more credible and to exhibit greater scholarship than a book by an evangelical publisher, even though this assumption is clearly false in certain cases. Here's the problem. This raises for trust in God. Without even knowing it, we all carry with us this cultural map, this background set of assumptions, and our self-talk, the things that form our default beliefs, ones we naturally accept without argument. The things we are embarrassed to believe, if they run contrary to the authorities in our map, and relates, related matters create a natural set of doubts about Christianity. Most of these factors are things of which people are not even aware. In fact, they are, if they are brought to one's attention, one would, be, one would most likely disown them, even though, in fact, they are the internalized ideals that actually shape what people do and don't believe. Our current Western plausibility structure elevates science and scorns and mocks religion, especially Christian teaching. And it has been the acceptance of theistic evolution by many Christians that has contributed most significantly to this situation. Why? There are at least three reasons. First, theistic evolution reinforces scientism because it exemplifies the view that when science and biblical theological teachings are in conflict, we have to revise the Bible. We don't ever revise the science because scientific truth claims ex exhibit solid knowledge based on the facts. Second, this sort of revisionism, changing biblical interpretations that have held steady for 2,000 years at just the time when there is politically correct pressure to do so, especially when the pressure comes from science, gives off the message that biblical teaching is pretty tentative. We shouldn't hold on to it with strong conviction because if we do, we may become embarrassed when we, come, when we have to revise that teaching in years to come. Third, the most pervasive definition of theistic evolution is that the general naturalistic theory of evolution is true and God is allowed somehow or other to be involved in the process as long as there's no way to detect his involvement. Design and biology must be unknowable and undetectable. For a thinking unbeliever, or a believer for that matter, the question surfaces as to why anyone should think God had anything to do with the development of life. What exactly did God do, and how could we know the answer to that, this question? If he was involved, no one could know it. So God begins to take on some of the characteristics of the tooth fairy. As a result, the attitude seems to be that for intelligent, well-educated people, commitment to Christianity should not rise above the level of a hobby. And thus we see that believers in Western cultures do not as readily believe the supernatural worldview of the Bible in comparison with their third world brothers and sisters. As Christian anthropologist Charles Kraft observes, in comparison to other societies, Americans and the other North Atlantic peoples are naturalistic. Non-Western peoples are frequently concerned about the activities of supernatural beings. <coughs> Though many Westerners retain a value, vague belief in God. Most deny the uh, other supernatural beings even exist. The wide-ranging supernaturalism of most of the societies of the world is absent for most of our people. 
our focus is on the natural world with little or no attention paid to the supernatural world. There's a straightforward application here for evangelism and church growth. A person's plausibility structure is the set of ideas a person either is or is not willing to entertain as possibly true. For example, no one would come to a lecture defending a flat earth because this idea is just not part of our plausibility structure. We cannot even entertain the idea. Moreover, a person's plausibility structure is a function of the beliefs he or she already has. Applied to evangelism, J. Gresham Mackham got it right when he said, God usually exerts that, the regenerative power, in, con in connection with certain prior conditions of the human mind. And it should be ours to create, so far as we can, with the help of God, those favorable conditions for the reception of the gospel. False ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed in only winning a straggler here and there if we permit the whole collective thought of the nation or, the, or of the world to be controlled by ideas which, by the resistless force of logic, prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. The simple truth is that ideas have consequences. If a culture reaches the point where Christian claims are not even part of its plausibility structure, fewer and fewer people will be able to entertain the possibility that such claims might be true. And theistic evolution has helped to place Christianity outside our church's plausibility structure. To see this, consider the following example. A few years ago, when I picked up the morning paper, I found a two-page feature story in, one, in the sections one titled Intelligent De Design Debate Heats Up. The, author, uh, the article cites John F. Hott, a uh, lay Catholic theologian at Georgetown University, as, oppo as opposing intelligent design theories, bad science, and bad theology. According to Hott, just as different explanations can be proffered for while wa why water is boiling as evidence that the kinetic energy of the water molecules are responsible for responding to heat, or as evidence that someone wants tea, so evolution can be seen both as the result of natural selection and as part of God's purposes. I disagree with Hawk about the scientific and theological merits of ID theory, but he is entitled to his opinion. If ID theory is bad theology and bad science, and so be it. What troubles me, however, is that Hawk and others who opt for scientific pardon me, for opt for theistic evolution, seem to do so with little appreciation for the emergence of scientism in our culture and its impact on people's perception of the availability of theological, eth ethical, and political knowledge. Theistic evolution is intellectual pacifism that lulls people to sleep while the barbarians are at the gates. In my experience, theistic evolutionists are usually trying to create a safe truce with science so that Christians can be left alone to practice their privatized religion while, while retaining the respect of the dominant intellectual culture. And while this may not be true of all theistic evolutionists, the majority of the ones I have met have a view of theology and faith as exhibiting very low cognitive value, while science is the most cognitively excellent approach to knowledge we have. For example, theistic evolutionist physician, physicist and active member of Biologos, Carl Giberson, has said of science, I would argue that it is the most epistemologically secure perspective we have. By contrast, as I have said elsewhere of Giberson, he also seems to regard theology as a degenerative program forever mired in Kuhnian periods of crisis when no one can agree on the best paradigm, when no progress is evident, and when theologians do more to impede the search for scientific knowledge than to contribute to its progress. It is hard to see how such a view could countenance theological knowledge. In fact, Giberson's understanding of faith seems to include the notion that as rational justification for a particular belief incre increases, the possibility of faith decreases. This is seen, for example, in his contrast between the limited faith involved in the inference of water at the bottom of a well from the observation of a splash and the so-called profound faith of the theist. For Giberson, such a faith is profound, I suppose, in light of the low epistemological value of theology as a discipline. Giberson's theistic evolution is rooted in weak scientism, which is inevitably 
which inevitably results in placing biblical teaching and theology outside the plausibility structure and depicting them as largely non-cognitive fields based on a blind, profound faith. And I maintain that, however unintentional it may be, this is the posture and the result of most theistic evolutionists. I'm not interested in that posture. I don't want to play merely not to lose. I want to play to win. I want to win people to Christ and to destroy strongholds that undermine the knowledge of God, to penetrate culture with a Christian worldview, to undermine our church's plausibility structures, which as things now stand does not include objective theological claims. This is why apologetics, especially scientific apologetics, precisely like what we find in the intellectual design movement is so crucial to evangelism and church growth. It seeks to create a plausibility structure in a person's mind, favorable conditions, as Machen put it, so that the gospel can be considered. And I believe we will need to rethink the message we are giving to the culture when we constantly fail to have confidence in the knowledge claims of scripture and repeatedly revise the Bible, as theistic evolutionists do, when scientists tell us we must. When science appears to conflict with scripture, we shouldn't immediately lay our intellectual arms down and wait for scientists to tell us what we, allow, what we can allow the Bible to say and how we need to revise scripture. No, we should be patient, acknowledge the problem, and press into service Christian intellectuals who are highly qualified academically, who have respect for the fact that scripture presents us with knowledge, not just truth to be accepted by blind faith, and who want to work to preserve the traditional interpretation of scripture and avoid revisionism. These intellectuals should be encouraged to develop rigorous models that preserve historical Christian teaching, except of course in cases where interpretation of scripture has been wrong. These intellectuals are heroes because they value loyalty to historic understandings of scripture over the desire to fit in with what scientists are currently claiming. The intellectual design movement is just such a, such a set of intellectuals. Adolfo Lopez Otero, professor of material science and engineering at Stanford and an atheist, was once asked what an unbelieving intellectual expects from a Christian thinker. Lopez Otero said that the Christians should be daring and humble, try not to act like your superior, in approaching other professors and secular thinkers. Be as daring as politeness and civilized behavior allows. But as I implied before, do not be shy to deconstruct the pretentiousness of his, the atheist, worldview in the same way that he is not shy to point out the triumphs of science, the enlightenment and rationalism over the superstitions of religion. Lopez Otero goes on to say that Christian thinkers cannot afford to give excuses for their faith. This is the price that they must pay for having declared themselves Christians. In my opinion, advocates of the intelligent design movement are doing exactly what Lopez, Lopez Otero correctly describes. ID advocates deconstruct the pretentiousness of truth claims that go against biblical assertions. It should be clear that naturalism is not consistent with biblical Christianity. If that's true, then the church should do all it can to undermine the worldview of naturalism and to promote, among other things, a cognitive uh, alethic nature of theology, biblical teachings, um, that comes from the Greek word aletheia, which means truth, um, and ethics. This means that when Christians consider adopting certain views widely accepted in the culture, they must factor in their consideration whether or not such an adoption would enhance naturalism hegemony and help dig the church's own grave by contributing to a hostile, und undermining plausibility structure. Consider as an example the abandonment of belief in the histor historical reality of Adam and Eve. Now, if someone does not believe in Adam and Eve were real historical individuals, then so be it. My present concern is not with the truth or falsity of the historical view, though that ma issue matters greatly. Rather, my concern is the readiness, sometimes eagerness, of some to set aside the traditional view, the ease with which the real estate of historical Christian commitments is abandoned, and the unintended con consequences of jettisoning such a belief. Given the current plausibility structure set by scientific naturalism, rejecting the historical Adam and Eve contributes to the marginalization of Christian teachings in the public square and in the church, and thereby those who reject Adam and Eve unintentionally undermining the church. How so? First, 
The rejection reinforces the idea that science and science alone is competent to get at the real truth of reality. Theology and biblical teachings are not up to the task. Second, the rejection of historical Adam and Eve reinforces the privatized, non-cognitive status of biblical doctrine, ethics, and practice, especially supernatural ones that need to be construed as knowledge if they are to be passed on to others with integrity and care. If the church has been mistaken about one of its central teachings for 2,000 years, why should we trust the church regarding its teachings about extramarital sex, homosexuality, or the role of women in the church? Admittedly, the church is not infallible in its teachings, still to the degree that its central teachings through the ages are revised. To that degree, the non-revised teachings are also undermined in their cognitive and religious authority. The non-revised teachings become more tentative. Finally, the rejection of such key Christian beliefs reinforces the modernist notion that we are individuals cut off from our church community and that we are free to adopt new beliefs and practices in disregard of that community and our impact on it. If I'm right about broader issues, then the rejection of historical Adam and Eve have far more troubling implications than those that surface merely in trying to interpret certain biblical texts. The very status of biblical, theological, and ethical teachings as knowledge is at stake in the current cultural and milieu, as is the church's cognitive marginalization to a place outside the culture's plausibility structure. Those who reject a historical Adam and Eve inadvertently harm the church and become its grave digger. Three things to avoid if you want to, don't want to become a grave digger, and that's my ellipses that I missed, uh, put, turning green. There are three revisionist views that may be more acceptable to Christians but that, in my view, seriously undermine the plausibility of Christian teachings in general and that therefore undermine a growing, vibrant church. As we shall see, the adoption of theistic evolution leads to the other two areas of revision. Theistic evolution itself. It is widely acknowledged that, it, that evolutionary theory, to be clarified in more detail shortly, has made the world safe for atheists, to paraphrase Richard Dawkins. Whether theistic uh, or atheistic, when properly understood, evolutionary theory entails the denial of a scientifically detectable Christian God, and as a result, places the detection of design, divine design outside of science. Thus, former Cornell biologist William Provine proclaimed, let me summarize my view on modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning, and no free will for humans either. There are th three general understandings of evolution. Change within limits, microevolution, the thesis of common descent, and the blind watchmaker thesis. The first is accepted by everyone. The second is not yet established. And the third seems to me to be wildly implausible, especially given Christian theism as a background belief. And that's, again, my ellipsis. Recently, even the atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel has weighed in on the matter and claimed that this Darwinian thesis is impossible. Theistic evolution is a view that the blind watchmaker thesis is true, that there is no scientifically detectable evidence for God being involved in the process of evolution. Remember, theistic evolutionists are, common, are committed to me methodological naturalism and that we are free to reject metaphysical or philosophical naturalism, by blind faith, I suppose, even though we accept methodological naturalism while doing science. But theistic evolutionists fail to provide sufficient reasons for rejecting metaphysical naturalism. Why be a theist in the first place? After all, while evolution is logically consistent with theism, there's nothing in evolution that would lead one to theism, and if the God hypothesis isn't needed until humans appear, it is less credible to think it is needed subsequently. Adopting theistic evolution, people become the church's gravedigger. Their strategy may bring short-term success by keeping a handful of scientists from leaving the faith, but over the long haul, it will contribute to the secularization of culture with its scientific, scientific epistemology and to the marginalization of the church. After all, if we have to provide naturalistic revisions of the Bible over and over again, why take the yet-to-be-revised portions of Scripture seriously? Skipping a paragraph, if we want to be consistent and contend that core biblical teachings provide us with uh, items of knowledge, it seems to me that we should not let the naturalist camel's nose under the tent 
from the Big Bang up to the appearance of human life. Or it'll come in the rest of the way, presumably. Neuroscience and the soul. The great Presbyterian scholar J. Gresham Mackin once observed, I think we ought to hold uh, not only that man has a soul, but it is important that he should know he has a soul. And that's uh, Superscript 15. From a Christian perspective, this is a trustworthy saying. Christianity is a dualist, interactionist religion in this sense. Physicalism, by contrast, is the view that the universe is all there is and everything that exists in it is entirely physical. Thus, upon death, there is no disembodied intermediate state between death and the final resurrection. And that is also my... Boy, I'm missing a few of those. Um, when people receive new resurrected bodies. In my view, Christian physicalism involves a politically correct revision of the biblical text that fails to be convincing. Nancy Murphy, according to Murphy, science has provided a massive amount of evidence suggesting that we need not postulate the existence of an entity such as a soul or mind in order to explain life and consciousness. One of these pieces of evidence is evolution. Skipping over a few, as I've already pointed out, it is almost universally acknowledged that naturalistic evolution cannot explain the origin of, of consciousness or soul. And claiming that consciousness is emergent is just a name for the problem, not a solution. Thus, if God were to insert consciousness or souls into the evolutionary process, we no longer have evolution, strictly speaking. Skipping on, Eben Alexander, he, uh, he talks about near-death experiences, and I'm going to skip over the rest of that. Um, doctrine and ethics. Finally, the adoption of theistic evolution has undermined the cognitive authority of biblical doctrine and ethical teaching and thus has contributed to a revisionist approach to them. How so? Um, it talks about the non-overlapping ma magisterium that most, so, most of you will remember from S Stephen Jay Gould. And theistic evolution has renamed that complementarity. The complementarity view... The, and the theistic evolution that supports it is a chief grave digger of the contemporary church in Western culture. After all, if the areas of the Bible that can be tested require that we revise its teachings and adopt theistic evolution, why should we continue to embrace culturally embarrassing doctrinal views? For example, that hell is real and some people will go there. Or ethical positions, and interestingly enough, he doesn't say that some people are there. Um, or ethical positions, for example, that homosexual practice is deeply immoral. As I have admitted earlier, the church's teaching is not infallible. Still, we should, not, we should be very careful and reluctant to revise what the church has held for centuries, especially when two factors are present. One, there is available and intellectually robust defense of the traditional view, and two, there is politically correct pressure to suddenly to find that the Bible all along taught what our secular friends and peers tell us it should teach if we're going to be culturally and academically respectable. There's a sober-mindedness that should characterize any self-identifying Christian scholar or pastor regarding these matters, since our laity often look to us or consider us as representative spokespersons of the Christian tradition. To many lay people, it seems hardly a coincidence that just when the naturalistically informed culture puts pressure on us to believe a certain thing, even though the history of biblical interpretation supports the exact opposite, we conveniently discover that we have misunderstood the scriptures all along. I think the Christian community expects more courage out of its leaders, and we run the risk of making our own desired views of biblical interpretation more authoritative than the text itself. It is as though some exegetes have a desired view that they want to sustain, and they fiddle with the Bible until they get it to turn out the right way. Uh, revisions of the church's teachings about homosexuality seem suspicious in just this way. I'm not arguing that the current revisionist views are false, though I believe that to be the case. What I am urging us to consider is the unintended consequences of embracing revisionist positions. The marginalization of Christian doctrines and ethics after all, if we find the church was wrong for 2,000 years just at the time when it is convenient to make such a discovery, what does this say about the epistemic or rational and aletheic or truth status of the views we just happen not to have revised at present? 
and the placement of Christianity outside the plausibility structure. And when we do consider this, we should come to the conclusion that the revisionist position of theistic evolution has made it much easier to revise other biblical teachings when there is cultural pressure on us to do so. Now, that's the end of the chapter. I suspect that Moreland and I disagree somewhat on the soul. I don't believe in conscious immortality of the soul for reasons that I've argued in scientific theology. Uh, however, I do think not only that souls do exist, but that matter is dependent on them rather than they being dependent on matter. That's arguable from quantum mechanics that the real world, as it is sometimes termed, is not actually fundamental. That we actually get to decide what, what, kind of what the real world is going to display. Raising the question of whether it was real to begin with. I think the real world is actually dependent on God, what, who mostly gives us a reliable background with, whom, with which to interact with each other, but who maintains ultimate control. And that's why we can't determine what a particle will be. We can only determine uh, uh, what choices the particle has. On Moreland's other points, I couldn't agree more. If we back off on the first 11 chapters of Genesis, why well, maintain that the Exodus happened substantially the way it was recorded? If we back off in the Exodus, why maintain that the resurrection happened substantially as recorded? And once you go there, Christianity is done. Moreland's arguments cannot make us intelligent design advocates or creationists, but it can allow us to see the stakes involved. And extraordinary claims, I think, should require extraordinary evidence. The book notes that this extraordinary evidence for evolution does not exist. Then it shows why it is important, starting with this chapter. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I have two comments, one here, and then we want to pass the mic up that way, and we'll... Uh, Charles. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, I, it just seems to me that uh, it's a rather arbitrary uh, decision on uh, the materialistic world to say that uh, what I can sense is okay in don't talk to me about anything beyond. Uh, why limit truth to our senses? Uh, there could be reality beyond that. There's no rule to say that there should not be reality beyond that. And... Uh, he uses the consciousness and, and the soul as uh, examples beyond that. I, I would like to, uh, well, I, I agree with you, the soul uh, is, can be defined different ways. Uh, but uh, free will, for instance, our whole society, at least <laughs> uh, used to be, uh, and where we enforce laws and so on, they used to be uh, based on the fact that we have free will and that a person is responsible for his, for his behavior. And that is a concept you won't find in matter, in sensory matter. It's, 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 it's not there, but it, it exists. At least our society seems to think it exists. You are responsible for what you do, and if you do this, you're going to be put in the jail and so on, this type of thing. And uh, and I would add to that the uh, concept of morality. Uh, most people claim they have a degree of morality to a certain extent. Scientists often defend, oh, yeah, I'm a very moral type of thing, not realizing there's actually nothing in sensory uh, mechanistic ideas that ever would promote any morality. Why should matter have morality? Uh, so... Uh, 
this idea that you're going to limit your worldview to uh, sensory factors only, uh, I think, falls apart. And uh, it's purely arbitrary, and I, I, I think uh, science needs to recognize, hey, there's something beyond uh, beyond this, although many scientists uh, claim otherwise, and others uh, support that. Well, I think that science, in fact, does recognize that. And, uh, in fact, uh, although it's a popular perversion of science, and uh, for that reason can be discussed, uh, in terms of philosophical science, uh, positivism has long been recognized as a failure. Mm -hmm. The idea that we look up at the sky and we see a bright light um, and that's all we can describe is just nuts. There is something up there that is giving the light and we can even make reasonable estimates as to how far away it is, what it's composed of, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, without ever having visited it. Um, without even the reasonable possibility of visiting it. Um, certainly not with the reasonable possibility of visiting it and coming back to be able to describe the experience. Um, and uh, that's true. Uh, that's true for a large number of, of, of things. It's not just uh, the... Uh, the the sun we believe in atoms nobody's ever seen an atom we believe in electrons nobody's ever seen an electron you've seen the tracks that they sometimes make uh, that's as close as we can get uh, the fact of the matter is we believe in all kinds of stuff we've never seen nobody's ever seen for that matter the Cambrian These are all constructs beyond what we can actually see, experience. All we can do is to see the results of them, uh, how they influence other things that we can see. You can go up and see fossils in certain parts of British Columbia. I've done that. Uh, does that make them, uh, uh, you know... Uh, I presume that the, that those were once uh, living animals, but I haven't seen the animals. Nobody's even seen the kind of animals that's up there, depending on how loosely you uh, describe kind. Nobody has ever seen an example of Anomalocaris, for example. We're de deducing that based on a certain hard pieces of stone that, that look like uh, they once were either parts of an animal or replacements for those parts. That's the fact of the matter. We haven't seen a lot of stuff that we believe in in science. And so the idea that because we can't see God or we don't usually see angels, um, that you can't believe in them is just crazy from a purely scientific perspective. Um, and positivism, like I say, is dead in science. There are just a lot of people who haven't realized that. And in fact, what I think has happened is that positivism has been kind of semi-adopted as a, as a posture by mm -hmm. some people who claim to be influenced by scientism. Mm -hmm. and, and, they, and, and when pressed, they don't really have a good defense for it either. I think that's where the, the problem lies, is that uh, positivism is used as an excuse to enhance scientists by people who are not very deep thinkers, who might state... Uh, uh, yeah. and so on, and it's a popular thinking 
and it does it is supported to a certain extent by the fact that uh, our reality is, is kind of overwhelmed by sensory information yeah uh, and so we we, uh, we tend to uh, yield to that but it's yeah. it is arbitrary to say hey there's nothing beyond that well one of the things that I think is a key is that we believe in a lot of non sensory stuff because of evidence that we put together to to say this makes the most sense of that evidence. Either things like the sun or things like uh, the uh, animals in the Cambrian. And uh, so it's perfectly reasonable to believe in, in, in stuff because of the effects it makes. Now here's where I think Christians really, in general, Adventists in particular, have a responsibility. It will be to, to show that, in fact, some of those unseen entities do make a difference in what we can see and feel and, and experience today. I think if we don't do that, we do put ourselves in the position of uh, being effectively what he's accusing uh, theistic evolutionists of, I think rightly. And I think whenever, you know, it is, it is one thing to say that, uh, that, um, that I believe in God. It's another thing to say I believe in God because of experiences that are easily best explained by God's existence. The one is a faith without evidence and sometimes maybe even in the teeth of evidence. The other one is faith that 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 my experience is coherent and that if you take God out of it, my experience then becomes less coherent. Probably what uh, is not mentioned in the chapter but is very important, at least to me, is all that scientific evidence that doesn't work by itself. Naturalism has failed to explain many things like the precision of the forces of physics or the origin of life and so on. We've gone through that many times. But these are facts that are right there that add to the equation. Yes. Go ahead. This, I got one, thanks. <clears throat> this is fascinating to me, bringing it down to kind of my level. The Christians are our own grave diggers. Kind of known that for a while. And so my questions would be, and this may be too big for today, is there an LBGT plus gene? And is this gene compatible with fluid sexuality? And this whole idea of an emergent church, emergent philosophy, and now I'm beginning to see it in science, emergent science, that now is saying that humans are uh, evolving into something that is not uh, a binary world that we think that God created. So, and I've heard this recently, uh, Christians say, well, the science is in, they can't help it, we have to accept it. Where do we go from that point of view? Well, they can't help it will be a difficult subject to address. Because how do you know that they could help it? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, but as far and, and I can't I can't answer the question for a transgender gene except that we except that we have seen an explosion in transgenderism in certain social circles, which suggests that it's not genetically determined primarily, or otherwise we would have seen that before. Now, I, I suppose one can say that there's a genetic influence underlying it, and when the uh, when the cultural pressure lets off, it suddenly pops up. Uh, is there a gene? 
but but to, to answer that question, nobody has identified such a gene. And yet we're hearing all the time yes, I, I know what you're saying. We we are being told that all the time that there is a gene. Well, uh, to be more specific, where we have more information because more research has been done, we can be very very specific that there is not a gay gene, which is the first two letters of of the LGBT um, because that's been done multiple times. We went through that uh, a year or two ago, I think, um, where people had done twin studies. And the twin studies simply do not uh, give you a gene that uh, determines that whole thing and you can't help it. That the most the most influence that one can have for a gene is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25, maybe 30% if you're looking at it optimistically. Um, and that's, by the way, not just for genes, but also for prenatal influences, because those are twin studies. Um, and because of that, um, the claim that this is that this is genetically determined is mostly rubbish. Now, I don't expect that to be happily agreed to by most of certainly by by politically correct society, because that's not something that they want to admit. Um, it is much more much more helpful to say that they can't help themselves, they're just they're doing what they're doing and that's it. And uh, who are you to inter, inter, uh, intervene in their fun? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the claim that is made is not actually backed up by science. And th this is one of the things that I think you have to realize is that there is science and there is science. There are things that, that are claimed that are pretty reliably demonstrated regardless of your opinion. You know, if I take this pen, I hold it up here, and I drop it, you know where it's going to go, right? Not much question. Uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, on the other hand, uh, if... Uh, you know, some parts of science are under political pressure, and so lesser standards of proof are often accepted, and greater ignorance of contrary facts is often accepted. And for those things, one of the things that's happened, and we'll see it next week, is, uh, you know, the bolt money and, well, if you believe in cell phones and you uh, and you believe in that, then you have to accept everything that science says. Well, science has varying quality, and you just have to you have to put that into what you're factoring in. Well, I put up my hand before I heard the rest of your answer. You're you're very much up to date from my perception. Um, the estimate of something under 20% genetic influence for homosexuality you see frequently in the literature. Uh, those who are promoting the necessity of a homosexual behavior... They need it to be 90 to 100% in order to work. Yeah, and, and they're, they're a bit disturbed that you can't go to a single gene. The idea of a single gene came from a homosexual neuroscientist who said he had discovered it and it was in, in a very uh, influential part of, it was active in a very influential part of the nervous system. But that had been repeatedly debunked. Well, the twin studies say it's not only not a gene, it's not even a combination of genes. It's not only a gene, and it's not a combination of genes, it's not a combination of genes and, uh, no. in, in, uh, and a prenatal environment because uh, Identical twins have all of that, and the closest that we can get with all of those influences 
is like 25. If you look at the data mm -hmm. with squinty eyes, you can get 30 percent out. Of course, recently, if you throw epigenetics into the picture, it gets uh, more interesting and much more complicated. But even with even with the epigenetics thrown in, the twin studies should be should be higher. Sure, and they're not. Uh, but actually, and I've I've read because we have homosexuality in my family, uh, someone I love very much. I, as a neuroscientist, I've tried to dig into it, and my take at this point is that uh, there. Well, there is one additional factor I don't think you mentioned. That is the incidence during childhood of parental abuse is substantially higher in homosexuals than in non-homosexuals. And uh, they've come to recognize this. An interesting sidelight is the really hardcore homosexual scientists unequivocally reject a genetic basis because they feel the behavioral choices are so positive that's what they want to define homosexuality they've made, it, made a better choice it depends there are some who will profess and I think one of our present presidential candidates has has said this and I know that I've seen others that have said this that if they had a choice they wouldn't have done it and therefore it must not be a choice so you'll hear arguments on both well, sides I'm, of that I'm, particular. I'm point. sure he came to that statement with a very rational review of the information to basis for the basis. It uh, seemed he, like a much more yes, yes. a throwaway attempt to criticize someone who's recognized widely as a very sincere and active Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, human nature gets involved. What? what uh, one of the interesting things is you have not seen in the evolutionary literature an admission since the probability of reproducing genes in homosexuals Drops is much lower. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it should be evolutionarily disappearing. Yes. That's straightforward evolutionary theory. So uh, you, you take it's an evolutionary dead end. It sure. Really is. I mean, if you're going to, I mean, uh, and I'm just throw this, there isn't time to go into this now, but in my history as a student of behavior and the nervous system, it was fascinating quite a few years ago now to see the whole uproar that occurred when a passerine, a male passerine bird species that was not mated chose to uh, add its care to the nest of the, uh, not a sibling, well, add its care to the nest and offspring of another member of the same species. And there was a huge discussion on uh, altruism, which was ultimately re resolved, in quote, in many quotes, by showing that that male was actually giving additional care to a genetically related pair. So in, a, in an indirect way, it was increasing the incident of, of its own genes, regardless yeah. if it hadn't reproduced. So but instead of, instead of uh, personal selection, you had kin selection. Yes, kin selection is the, is the term that came out of it. However, if you come up with, as, as I've done some reading, with some of altruistic behavior, that has no chance to be based on twin selection, uh, you can't get the paper published. So it's very, so, very so interesting that they focused on what may be a small answer for altruistic behavior, but ignore the much wider range. So if I heard correctly, you're suggesting that what you see in the published science literature is not all there is to science in the proper sense. Oh, yes. Well, well, it's just as hard in disciplines outside of origins to to con confront the going and widely accepted theory. Uh, many, many journals just won't even consider publishing. And as you have found out in, in other ways a number of times. 
One more comment here. Sure. Um, this is just an observation. See what you think about this. Um, there is a society, one country in Asia, where the mother is the dominating figure in the family, and the I've never seen so much of homosexuality anywhere in the world that I've been to uh, than here in this country. Any thought where the mother is the boss of the family and then the boys have a tendency to, or it just, just happens? I don't know that I have answers for that. That doesn't mean they don't exist somewhere, it's just I don't know them. And it, it's just an observance, you know, I mean, I thought maybe this is... Yeah. Well, with that, I'm going to invite you to come back next week, and we'll be discussing uh, miracles, uh, first from somebody else's perspective, and then I'll throw in my two cents at the end. And then you can have fun with that.